should Theresa May stand down as the British Prime Minister? Various opinion polls have found that Mrs May and Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn are neck and neck on who would make the better British Premier, with nearly half of Britons thinking Theresa May should stand down as Prime Minister. Jeremy Corbyn's party achieved victory in previously safe Conservative constituencies across the land in that election. Former Chancellor George Osborne called Theresa May a dead woman walking two days after the general election. He said Mrs May's days in Downing Street were clearly numbered, adding, it's just how long she is going to remain on death row. Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson remains favourite to replace her, though he denies a challenge, with others, such as Brexit Minister David Davis, also being considered as an interim leader. Hundreds of members of the public assembled at Parliament to protest against Theresa May's DUP deal. There have been angry scenes when Mrs May has made public appearances. The style of engagement with citizens has been repeatedly criticised, and her personal standing amongst the general public has collapsed to the lowest levels since she became Prime Minister. What caused the massive miscalculation of Conservative support? And how would some kind of coalition government between the Conservatives and the Democratic Unionist Party handle Brexit negotiations? Simple questions with important answers. We started by asking if the public here in London thought Theresa May should resign as Britain's Prime Minister and why. Here's what they said. No, I don't. I think she should carry on as she is. She has the full support of most of the country, so why not? I do. I think she's lost the changing room and I think that she's lost the... Uh, lost the... Uh, the confidence of the people as well. OK, yes, I think Theresa May should resign because I think that she's very incompetent. If you look at Brexit, how she ran the general election, uh, Grenfell Tower and how she dealt with that. And just also speaking to friends who are Conservative, Lib Dem, Green Party, Labour, like we all think she's just incompetent and she should go. I think she's doing the best she can, but I think that she's lost the country's support. Um, I think it's a good idea to resign for her. I don't think she should stand down. Um, I think there are elements of the way she's conducted herself over the far past few weeks that um, have an element of uh, criticism to it. Um, but I think standing down is, 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 is a last resort. No, she's not directly responsible for anything at all. I don't think she should stand down. Um, there are wider issues that need to be addressed. So, uh, yeah, I don't think she should stand down at all. I do think she should resign and I think she has lost the confidence of the people. She's never really had the confidence, in my view, of the cabinet she's put together and unfortunately I don't think she is the right person to negotiate a deal with Europe or to negotiate a deal with whichever minor parties she might be able to find to cobble together support for a Queen's speech. Legally speaking, yes, because she leads the largest party in, in Parliament and therefore she's entitled to try to find a way to form a government in this particular case because she has no majority, she needs to negotiate with other political parties. So legally speaking, yes, she doesn't have any reasons to resign. Secondly, in terms of her leadership, she should go. One, because she's shown no leadership in terms of not only the uh, terrorist attacks that we suffer in Manchester and London in recent weeks, but also in terms of the kind of leadership we need to negotiate Brexit, that is the uh, divorce between the European Union and the United Kingdom after the referendum last year. She wanted to have a strong mandate to do this negotiation. She hasn't got that mandate. The British people did not give it to her. But also she's shown a lack of leadership in terms of the current situation in the UK in terms of the terrorist attacks and in terms of the fire, the fire that destroyed and killed many people in Grenfell Tower in West London. So in that particular case, she has no quality in terms of leadership, she has no capacity to lead the country in this particular juncture, and therefore in that particular case, although legally speaking she doesn't have to go, in this particular case, legal in terms of political elements, she has to go. I think Theresa May made the biggest miscalculation of her career in deciding to call a snap general election based on polls which showed that the Labour Party would, was doing badly and that the Conservatives would be returned with a substantial majority. 
and indeed in calling the snap election she created a situation whereby she had to increase the majority she had in order to be successful. It wasn't just even enough for her to win but she had to come back with an increased majority. In the circumstances of course she failed to get a majority, it was a hung parliament and she's been forced into get, trying to get a narrow majority in a deal with the Democratic Unionist Party from Northern Ireland. And this is seen as a humiliation for Theresa May. Experienced political commentators were completely incorrect with their election predictions. Was this due to the polling system? Had they underestimated the level of anger towards the Conservative Party and their austerity programme? Or was it something else? We asked the public. Well, he usually he does what he usually does. He just promises everything, knowing he ain't going to get into power. And uh, you know, so this is what politicians do, isn't it? They uh, they say what we will do when we get if we get into power, but when they get there, they realise they can't. So you know, it's just a matter of misdirection rather than downright lies. I just think that they underestimated people's mood in terms of being tied with general elections, with being tied with politics and how it's done, whether it's left or right, it just seems like more of the same and um, just general, um, yeah, maybe there's issues with the way they do polling now and um, underestimating people like young people who go out to vote and this sort of thing. I think it changed for the young vote really, I, I think uh, Tr Theresa May's U-turn on, on the uh, on the on the elderly side of, of, of her manifesto failed uh, and I think the young vote came through very strongly. I don't think Jeremy Corbyn did anything spectacularly brilliant to change the, over out, the overall outcome uh, but I think it's, it's the public vote and I think people are in a position where I, I don't think anybody really knows exactly what is, is for the better at this moment. Well I think it's typical of quite a lot of recent elections where public opinion before the election seems to be it seems to be the more vocal people t tend to come out before the election but when it comes to the actual day itself they either don't show up or they change their mind um, or maybe it's they're thinking with their heart when they're talking uh, pre-election but then when it comes to the actual putting the cross in the box they either don't do it or they put the cross in for this someone else. First of all the Conservative Party took the electorate for granted. The Conservative Party was ahead in the opinion polls by almost 21% at the time uh, Theresa May called this election in mid-April. They underestimated the capacity of Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party, to mobilise people, but also they overestimated their own capacity to campaign. She showed no contact with people during that campaign. She didn't show any kind of capacity to interact with people, unlike Jeremy Corbyn, who led huge rallies. But also, people are tired of the austerity. Basically, the argument is this. Austerity is a political decision, it's not a necessity, which is the argument that the Labour Party has been using. And people got that message, and people decided to embrace that message. And they decided, they realised that unless they got rid of this government, austerity will continue, will affect the most vulnerable members of society when rich people are getting tax rebates and, and advantages that are making it very difficult for the government to get income for the fiscal policies. So they underestimated, they underestimated, they overestimated their own capacity to win. They underestimated the capacity of the Labour Party to lead a good campaign. And people are tired of austerity and they said to the government, we don't want any more austerity anymore, please go. I think the polls were inaccurate right up until the very end because they couldn't find out what was going on among many people who had not voted before. Jeremy Corbyn's campaign, the leader of the Labour Party, touched areas of the country who normally would not be involved in the political process. That was particularly true among young people and students. So, for instance, in Canterbury, the Labour Party won a spectacular victory on the basis of mobilising young people and students in particular. But also other sections of the population who felt alienated from British society, who felt in contact with Corbyn because he came across as an ordinary person. In contrast, Theresa May came across as a robot, unfeeling. So I think the polls were unable to gauge what was going on with Corbyn's campaign. This was something very unusual. M popular meetings, mass meetings, thousands of people coming to hear him across the country, mobilising people who not normally took part in the political process, and therefore the polls couldn't quite gauge what was going on in terms of the impact of Labour's campaign. Theresa May wants to govern with support from the Democratic Unionist Party, which has strong historic links to terrorism. 
even though May criticised Corbyn for being a terrorist sympathiser. What does the public think about this? There's huge hypocrisy from the Conservatives doing a deal with DUP in terms of like gay rights, abortion, yeah, terrorism. Um, I just don't think it's a good deal and it just shows their desperation. Of course, because they don't have nothing in common. It's ridiculous. It's only for staying in power, it's ridiculous. I think it's better to go and or make a new election for, to see what happens. Well, I'd like to think that both parties have put the, those uh, bad days of the leading up to the, to the Good Friday Agreement behind them. I think hopefully they've put that in the past and they're gonna, they're gonna, everyone's going to honour the Good Friday Agreement. Um, yeah, there have been differences on both sides, but those differences haven't been the main uh, main policies of either party. So uh, I think it's just a case of getting down, moving on. If they want to do a deal with someone or whatever they want to call it, coalition or deal, it's up to them to decide and, uh, and time will tell uh, every week in Parliament. Of course there's a contradiction. I don't think we need to go into a very great detail about this. This is... Uh, this is pretty cut and dried. There are excellent reasons why a deal with uh, the Democratic Unionist Party could work. There is absolutely nothing in their past support for terrorist activities um, and their current support, if you like, for um, some of the ongoing problems that would mean that they couldn't form a coalition. The reason they cannot and should not form um, a coalition with the Conservative Party is clearly the ongoing ne negotiations in Stormont. The fact that they're not looking at a coalition, they're looking at a confidence and supply issue, um, even that is problematic to all but the most one-eyed observers. It's quite ironic that the Conservative Party and its friends in the media, most of the right-wing media, spend a great deal of time, in, even on the election day, accusing Jeremy Corbyn of being a terrorist, a friend of terrorists, and having links with the nationalist Catholic terrorists, the IRA and, and, and Sinn Féin, this political wing. And now what they are doing is they are trying to form a coalition with a, the, the Democratic Unionist Party, a, cons, a, a conservative Protestant party that had links with paramilitary groups in Northern Ireland. Many of them became members of the DUP, and many of them formed the grassroots of the DUP. So in this particular case, Theresa May has lost the moral high ground in terms of who's friend of terrorists now. Uh, she made it clear that they will not form any coalition with the Labour Party, not even if they would have enough votes to form a government with the Labour Party, whereas Theresa May has no quarrel in aligning her party and herself with a party in Northern Ireland, the Protestant, from the Protestant side of the, of the, Northern, of the Northern Ireland, so political scene, which has clear links with former terrorist groups from the Protestant side. So she's made a huge mistake by doing this and she can no longer claim that the Labour Party is led by a friend of terrorists. Theresa May has entered into a pact with the Democratic Unionist Party. This is a party with a long history of involvement with loyalist paramilitaries. Indeed, during the general election campaign, the DUP leader Arlene Foster met with the leader of the Ulster Defence Association, the main loyalist paramilitary group, a group that had just, just carried out the killing of one of its uh, uh, own members in an internal feud. When she met with the UDA leader, she did not call for it to disband, not call for it to disarm. Contrast the way that Jeremy Corbyn, who had entered into discussions as have successive British governments with Sinn Féin in pursuit of a peace deal, was treated during the election when he was branded an IRA supporter. None of this was applied to Arlene Foster. This is an organisation, the DUP, which at one time had its own paramilitary wing, Ulster Resistance, who helped run arms through the, with the cooperation with the South African apartheid regime. So it's a long and checkered history. But above all, the question of the D, entering a deal with the DUP, aside from the fact it only gives Theresa May a majority of five, the British government is supposed to be a neutral referee in the Northern Ireland peace process, dealing with Sinn Féin on the one hand, the DUP on the other. It can no longer be that neutral referee in the Northern Ireland peace process, which is why former Tory Prime Minister John Major has brought questioned whether Theresa May is right to enter into a pact with the DUP. Since the general election, a YouGov poll found 48% of the public felt Theresa May should stand down, with 38% saying she should stay. Survation had 49% of people saying she should quit, with 38% again saying she should continue. Meanwhile, Servation gave Labour a substantial lead over the Tories, 
with Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party on 45% and Theresa May's Conservatives on 39%. Whoever becomes the next Prime Minister of the UK, how would the public like them to deal with Donald Trump? Donald Trump should be left to do what he does. I mean, the, why everybody in this country think they've got some kind of uh, right to criticise the President of the United States is beyond me, but I suppose that's social media and the modern life. Everybody thinks their opinion is worth listening to. Um, I just don't think they should deal with him at all. In terms of pulling out the Paris Climate Treaty, um, I'm an environmental consultant. It's something I'm really passionate about and it's something that future generations need and it's just devastating the fact that he's taken this stance and people should strongly stand against him and not work with him because he's not credible. Well, I think we need to try to put him in his place because he is very arrogant. He's just bad news all around. He's, he, he's, he, He's controversial, <coughs> controversial in a manner that, that, that involves controversial people that will be controversial in all walks of life. Um, and I don't think he should be in the position he's in. Yeah, he's a bit, uh, bit of a weird one. I, I, don't know if, uh, I don't know how long he's going to be around for, if he's going to dig himself any, any deeper holes. Uh, I've got relatives in America and uh, I couldn't believe how strong the feeling pro-Trump in America is. I don't think over here in the UK we get the full we get the full feeling and full sentiment of what the Americans truly think over there and what they've been through in the last 10, 15 years politically. I think there is an underlying special relationship that must be protected. Uh, Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, has said very clearly that Mr Trump should not be invited. He attacked the mayor of London when we were dealing with the terrorist, terrorist attack in London Bridge, which was an appalling thing to do. There was a demonstration not long after Trump was elected, a huge demonstration in London, basically saying we do not want Donald Trump in the UK. And he has, himself has cancelled the visit because he says that he will only come when the British people want him to come. That means that he's going to have to wait forever because the British people do not want Donald Trump in these aisles. Uh, Sadiq Khan said that the visit should be cancelled because uh, Mr. Trump goes against everything that British values represent. And it's actually a very good point. He, he's intolerant, he's racist, he's bigoted, and the British people do not want that. If he was invited, if, he, if the visit went ahead, there would be huge demonstration. It would make it very difficult for Mr. Trump to enjoy the limelight of a visit like this. So any government should say, Mr. Trump, we cannot invite you until you apologize for the remarks you've made, and you made it very clear that your policies you are applying are going to be reversed because that's not a kind of values that in British society support. So any government should say, no, Mr. Trump, you are not welcome here because the people do not want you here. Full stop. I think the question is correct in the sense that it implies that Theresa May is not going to be Prime Minister very, very long. The Conservative Party does not like failure and she failed in her general election bid. She made a huge mistake and she must be regarded as one of the most catastrophic Prime Ministers in British history. Plus the fallout of her failure to react to the terrible tragedy of the fire at Grenfell Tower. What I think has to be is a question is whether or not it is correct for Britain, for any successor to Theresa May, to pursue what she did, rushing to Washington to be the first foreign leader to visit Donald Trump, making it clear that there were going to be a close alliance between London and Washington. I think there has to be questioning of this at a time when America is becoming distanced itself from many of its allies, particularly in Europe. But also, Donald Trump is leading it into fresh military involvement in Afghanistan, in uh, support of the Saudi Arabia's in Yemen. We are seeing in breaking the talks over uh, climate change. Does any British government want to follow Donald Trump down that road? I want to see a U-turn here and a break from that alliance. Whether or not that can happen under a Conservative Party so closely wedded to the US Republicans is another matter. But if there is a general election in the next year, which I think likely, Jeremy Corbyn could become Prime Minister and that would mean a fundamental questioning of all aspects of British foreign policy. How, in the public's view, would a coalition government of the Conservatives and the Democratic Unionist Party handle Brexit negotiations? I don't think that Brexit is going to go very well personally and uh, yeah, she's lost her mandate and we shouldn't be going for a hard Brexit so we just have to see the outcome, no one really knows but I don't think it will be very successful. At the moment with the DUP and as previous statements mentioned with, with, with links to all sorts of political 
incorrectness, I don't think it's the right thing to do. Uh, to be honest, I don't. I think we're going to look back in a few years, and there aren't. I don't think there are going to be many changes at all after Brexit. I know Brexit is the the big word on, on everyone's lips at the moment. It's probably going to be the word of the year, or maybe the word of the decade. To be honest, I think actually the effects are going to be minimal. I don't think there's going to be anyone leaving the country. I don't think there's going to be any effects on uh, English people or British people abroad. A rejection of the customs union, a rejection of free movement, um, a rejection of all the other benefits that the European Union has brought us and could continue to bring us um, will be bad for Britain, it will be bad for British workers, it will be bad for British industry and I think it will be bad for Europe. So it's not too late, Theresa. Um, turn your back on the Brexit negotiations and take Emmanuel Macron at his word and think again about the decision to leave the European Union. It's going to be very difficult for the government because the DUP is in favour of soft borders. And if the government wants to implement its hard Brexit strategy, soft borders are not on the agenda because part of the peace process in Northern Ireland is an open border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland and the DUP supports that because it's part of the peace process and a hard border control would make it very difficult for the peace process to continue. So they want a soft border. The government wants to control immigration, which means that they want a hard border and how is the DUP going to accept that? They won't accept that. If the, if the alliance actually happened, the DUP will put pressure on the government to go for a soft Brexit approach, which means open soft borders. And the hard Brexiters, Brexiters in the Conservative Party will be very unhappy about this, and they won't accept that. So that could be a big problem for Theresa May when they start a negotiation for Brexit, because the DUP would be very reluctant to accept a hard Brexit, because they know that that would make things complicated for the peace process in Northern Ireland. The DUP is in favour of Brexit, it campaigned for Brexit, uh, despite the fact that a majority of people in Northern Ireland voted to remain in the European Union. It has little mandate. The question of what happens in terms of the Irish border is a huge issue in the Brexit negotiations. No one wants a hard border with custom posts in Ireland, but at the same time it is difficult to see how that can be avoided. If it can be avoided, that has ramifications for Scotland, which also voted to remain in the EU and doesn't want a hard border with the EU. It wants to be part of the customs union at least. So there are very complex issues. The Tory party itself is deeply divided and we've already seen uh, Theresa May's Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Finance Minister, Philip Hammond, basically attacking her position of a hard Brexit and in particular no deal is better than a bad deal as she said and saying there has to be a deal which benefits Great Britain P uh, PLC. The divisions over Europe still run deep in the Conservative Party and the Conservative Party struggling to get a majority in the House of Commons in which every Tory MP is needed, the conditions for rebellion are there. And plus, the DUP itself is not reliable. Leaving aside Irish issues, on a whole number of social and economic issues, its MPs that represent working class areas of Belfast in particular have tended to vote with Labour. So, for instance, they would oppose Theresa May's attempts at pension reform. They've said that. They are uh, not happy with privatisation of health services and so on. So we have here a parliament in which the government is scarcely in control and which the conditions for it being voted down are very, very likely. That is why I believe, because it can't get legislation through the House of Commons uh, consistently, there will be another general election. Theresa May will be forced to call it or her successor. And I also believe that the knives are out in terms of the Tory party because Theresa May was spectacular as a failure and probably the most inept prime minister in recent British general history. And coming after David Cameron, that is some feat. And so the political sharks in her own party may be circling around Theresa May. While Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson has dismissed claims that he is preparing a leadership bid as rubbish, other reports suggest Mr Johnson was preparing to go for the leadership, with a close ally saying it was go, 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 adding we need Bojo. Jeremy Corbyn has said that he has changed the face of British politics as his party defied the polls and made big election breakthroughs. It seems unlikely to many that Labour could form a government this year. After all, they didn't gain a majority on June the 8th. But the Conservatives certainly did squander one 
on account of a catastrophic miscalculation by the Conservative Prime Minister. Now Corbyn has it all to play for, while May has it all to lose.